Let, let, let me let me read first what we've got here officially about Geo. Geo is a mobile infrastructure engineer uh, working remotely with Automatic, the makers of WordPress.com, Tumblr, Pocket Casts, and even more. Uh, he writes about software and productivity at his website, geolody.com, uh, and he recently published Test Driven Development in Swift with Apris. Uh, when he's not working or spending time with his kids, you will likely find him reading or practicing to reach sub 30 on the 3x3 Rubik's Cube. Is that 30 minutes or 30 seconds? That's crazy. 30 seconds. Uh, so you're an order of magnitude slower than that. Yeah. Um, uh, but personally, I've known Joe for many years, and every talk and workshop that I've been to of his, I've come away with just great, practical, usable uh, advice that has improved my uh, my coding. So uh, please join me in welcoming Geo today. Seems. Hello, everyone. Um, before we get started, why don't we need a clap to James and all the rest of the AUC team for organizing this and bringing us back together after four years? That's great, isn't it? So how many developers are over here? Can we raise hands? Team leads? Yeah, designers? OK, well, you have to stay here. I had a joke about designers, but I'll, we'll save it for the next talk. Um, so what do you do as developers every day, apart from obviously writing great code. Ideas? Solve problems. Solve problems, yeah, yeah. Reviewing code. Reviewing code, nice. Anything else? Talk to other people, yeah, great. Um, well, me as a developer, I do a lot of st stack overflow. <laughs> uh, maybe these days more like asking ChatGPT to write code for me. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Um, there's a lot that we do as developers, as you, as you have already highlighted. In fact, I think coding is just the tip of the iceberg. There's much more that we do. It has to do with communicating with people, learning, and a lot of thinking. But um, yeah, coding is what we love to do, isn't it? At least I know myself, if I get a day where the only thing that I get to do is coding, that's a happy day. Unfortunately, we love coding so much that sometimes we over-optimize for coding, and that's everything that we focus on. And we end up with bottlenecks. The amazing code that we can write can't affect the impact that, that it could possibly have because we can't explain ourselves or like we don't really want to go hang out with other people to pitch our ideas. So this is why I'm suggesting that to improve as a software developer, there are other things other than just getting better at code that we can do. Too many, in fact, to fit in like a, what was supposed to be a 30-minute talk. So I just uh, have a few there, and I organize them in how to get better at work, how to get better at not working, and how to get better at team working. Before we get started, these are just ideas, tips. They are not prescriptions. They are suggestions. They are things that I hope you'll take home and you'll experiment with. If they don't work, at least there's a nice doggy there to brighten your day. So let's get started. How do we improve at working? Well, we need to get better at choosing what to work on. So a good way to get a lay of the land and find out valuable work to, to take on is to spread your work in a, imagine like a 2D plane, prioritize by urgency and how important it is. So this is sometimes called the Eisenhower matrix. We end up with four quadrants. So what ends up being the urgent and important, you should do now or as soon as possible. Then the things that are urgent, uh, they, that are not urgent, but are still important, you should schedule them. So do them as soon as you can, put them in your task manager, wherever. Then there are things that are urgent, but not important, and you should delegate them. Now, not everybody has the luxury of having someone to delegate stuff to. So sometimes you need to delegate them to your future self. As for what is neither urgent nor important, drop it. Or if it makes you feel better, write it in a someday maybe list. I know mine is very long. This is handy for choosing what to do, maybe at the large level, but it lacks the nuance to decide what to do on, on your day to day. So I recommend 
factoring in your energy level, because sometimes there's something that is very valuable. I got this on purpose. Um, something that is very valuable, like coding your new feature, but you just at the end of the day and you're too tired and you would do a very poor job at it, so do something else. Like um, Something else to factor in is also your time available. Again, you're at the end of the day. It would be very good to work on that new great feature, but uh, you're not even going to get started, so you might as well check your messages and make sure that you're up to date with stuff. Now, you have your plan, you know what you want to do. How do you go about executing, executing it and making sure that you're actually doing what you set out to do? Well, what I recommend doing is a technique called time block planning, which is just a fancy name for looking at your calendar and giving a job to every minute of your day. So here's as a you know, typical nine to five day. You get rid of all this stuff that is already occupied, like meetings, lunch. And then you say, well, the most important thing that I can do is co coding for project X. And I have a lot of energy in the morning, so I'm going to schedule a block at the very start of my day. And then, because I really want to make progress, one in the afternoon. Then, with the time left, what else can I do? Well, code reviews are very important. It's important to unblock your teammates. We'll talk about it later. And uh, in those slot le slots left, check messages so that we are up to date with what the rest of the team and the rest of the company is doing. Now, this is a very nice plan. It has to do with time. And uh, I need to talk about time management. And the first rule of time management is that you can't manage your time. So we like to think about time as like you know coins that we have in our purse that we can spend, invest, save. And that kind of works, but it's not a perfect analogy. I like to think at, at time, I like to think of time more as a credit card that has been stolen and now people are using it to buy action figures on eBay. Right? Because someone can suddenly say, hey, you know, uh, can you help me with this? People can steal your time, or like um, events can happen that steal time from you and there's nothing you can do about it. So what does that mean? That uh, wh while you have a plan, your plan is going to change. And that's okay. The value of making the plan is not to make the perfect plan that is never going to change, is to exert intentionality over your day. So the plan changed and, and that's okay. You know, here there's a bug and we need to jump on a call to fix it and scrap the project. And then the guy that the person that I was going to interview uh, has been sick, so scrap that as well and change change my plan. All right. Something that is good about planning and giving every minute of the of your day a job is that it stops you from context switching and multitasking, because you know. I'm going to coding. I'm going to code now. I'm not going to check Twitter. And why is context switching bad? It's so bad, in fact, that like I would recommend to do the opposite, context, context sticking. So why is context switching bad? Well, let's talk a bit about the brain real quick. We like to think about the brain as our most advanced technology. It used to be clockwork, then became steam engines, and now we think of the brain as a computer. The problem is that that's not the kind of computer that our brain is. It's more like this one. And in fact, when we talk about the, when you think about the working memory of our computer brain, the RAM, is actually more like a post-it note. This is a post-it note where whenever we take on a task, we hand write how to do the task in the post-it note. This is called a schema. So we load the schema in our working memory, and then we're left with some space in the post-it note, 4 to 12 items that we can hold in there at the same time, where we have our information that we're juggling. In, juggling. And then, say that like, uh, the build is building and it's very boring to look at that slow line moving very slowly, and so let me just check Slack. Now, the brain erases all the schema for coding and writes the schema for checking Slack. And then the build is finished, so like, let's go back to the build and the brain erases the, the schema for Slack and writes the schema for coding. And this is a very slow and inefficient, inefficient pro process, which comes with leftover. It's not precise. There's so-called attention residue that remains in the post-it note. What does this all mean? That if you have, if you're coding and then you jump around all the time, you are doing all these read-write operation and erasures from your post-it note, and you're using your working memory very poorly. It's much better to just look at the build progress bar going, because you don't, even if it's boring, and so you don't need to change schemas in your brain. 
if you really don't want to sit down, maybe take a walk, do some push-ups, do something, solve the Rubik's Cube, but don't do something that requires loading a new schema in your brain for work. All right, it was it, this was it for work. You've done all your planning, all your executing, all your context sticking. The work day is over. It's time to rest. We used to think of rest as the opposite of work, as a zero-sum game. If you're not working, you're not producing, so you're you know, not generating value. This is far from the truth. Especially for creative knowledge workers like software developer, rest can stimulate and sustain creativity. But not all breaks are created equal. There are four ingredients of good breaks, or four ingredients that a break should have to be considered good. The first one is relaxing. You know, going out on Main Street with all the traffic that's not really relaxing. It's not going to help you have a good break. The second is having control. Control on what you're doing with your time during your break. Don't be carried out by someone else's priorities. The third is mastery. So while resting, doing nothing, is a good use of time, it's also good to do something that is engaging and gives you a chance to practice your skill and master an art or a craft. And finally, detachment. A good break is one in which you detach from work, in which you allow your brain to put all the problems that you were juggling at work in your subconscious so that your subconscious can do pattern matching and uh, connection that the conscious mind can't do while you do something else. Now, detachment is, is critical, but it's also hard. It's hard to stop working. One reason is because we're always connected. I work for a distributed company, and so like uh, every hour of the day someone is working, there's something happening on Slack. But also, we love the work that we do. And so there are problems that are so challenging and so en engaging that we bring them on with us and we can stop think about it. But this is deleterious to our ability to rest. It's very beneficial to detach and let our subconscious mind do its job. So a good technique to help the mind transition from work mode to not work mode is a shutdown ritual. That is one or more activities that you do at the end of your day in a ritualistic manner. So it is like a, a routine with intention to give a signal to your brain and say, OK, it's time to stop working and do something else. That could be looking at all your open tabs and close the ones that uh, don't need to be open, write down the ones that have action to be taken, clean up your desk, go for a walk, find something that works for you and do it over and over, day after day, so that it starts sending a signal to your brain, OK, time to stop working. Now again on detachment, um, detachment is critical because we we want our brain to do its job and be focused on what we want it to be focused. But the brain, the mind, there's a mind of its own. There's a lot of things that can um, take it over from us. For example, say that this is your kitchen and uh, you're working from home. Will you be able to focus? Or will the messy, dirty kitchen be in the back of your mind and say, like, oh, look, uh, look how disgusting that is. You should really be cleaning it. So counterintuitively, it's better to clean the kitchen first and start work later because once the kitchen is clean, you can focus entirely on your work and you're not going to be distracted. In fact, anything that uh, can worry us and can put us in an anxious state of mind is very dangerous. First of all, because it's just not nice to live in a continuous state of anxiety. But from the working point, anxiety raises our threat detection level. So a comment that a colleague might, might make on your course, say, hey, did you think about um, I don't know, using a flat map there instead of a map? Can just make, you can interpret it as a threat. Oh my gosh, this is the third time that they make a comment that my code is not good. They must be thinking that I don't know what I'm doing. I'm going to be fired. What's going to happen to me? So it really pays to invest in calmness, in well-being, and in mental health. It, um, creates a positive self-reinforcing feedback loop, 
where you spend some time to get in a calm state of mind before work, and then you work better, which allows you to spend more time being in a calm state of mind, and then you work better, and then you also live better. So self-reinforcing positive feedback loop. You know what is a source of stress and anxiety? Teammates. This is a joke. This is a joke. I'm glad that someone laughed. Um, I'm kidding. So we work uh, sort of up, we usually work alone, right? You're just by yourself with your, with your computer, you write your code. But our work is not really that lonely. Because even when I work by myself in my own office, write my code, send it up for code review, and someone from the other side of the world reviews it and sends me feedback, and I um, work on the feedback and send another version up, we are all working together on the same piece of code, on the same piece of work as a team working together. So it's critical to raise up your awareness level from the individual to the team and to do whatever you can to unblock your team. An effective team will make you more effective. And from the outside, when someone looks at a high performing team, everyone looks at, as a top performer in that team. So take care of unblocking your teammate with the same attention and priority that you take in to further up your work. Now, to introduce the next topic, I have a little poll that I would like to do. Pizza, with or without pineapple? With pineapple? All right. Coffee, yeah, it's a question. Um, coffee, with or without sugar? With sugar? No one, okay, so someone over there, okay. And last one, carbonara, with or without cream? Without cream? All right, so you know, there was a bit of a, an even distribution in the room. Some of you said, no pineapple, no sugar, no cream. The other are wrong. <laughs> the point I'm trying to make with this lovely picture of, of spaghetti carbonara is that we're, we're all different in how we like to eat, but also in how we like to work. And so it's critical to adapt to how our teammates like to work. For example, going back to the food analogy, say that you come at my house and I offer you coffee. I know that you like sugar, I despise it, but I'm still gonna put the sugar container in the table so we can both enjoy the coffee the way that we like it. And the same goes for working with others. You want to understand how other people work so that you can tailor your interaction with them. A great way for, to do that is to ask them how they prefer to work. And a great way to ask them is to go through the managing oneself exercise by Legendary manager guru, Peter Drucker. You can find it online at Harvard, Harvard Business Review. It is a set of questions to ask like, are you, are you like to learn, are you like to work, what are your values? And then you can share it with your team and hopefully they will read it and share their own version back. And then you can tailor your, your interaction with them in that way. Final tip for the day, breadcrumbs. I'm not suggesting sprinkling breadcrumbs on your teammates, although that could be a fun bonding activity. Um, bringing the attention to the fact that our work doesn't exist again in isolation, but it lives in a knowledge network. So when you put up a PR, you might have the best code, the best test, please write tests. But if your PR description is like that, no one is going to know if your code is actually correct or not, because one implementation might be perfect for a scenario, but horrible in another. It depends on the context. It, it depends on the trade-offs that you have intentionally made. But a reviewer can't read your mind. So if to help them, you should leave context breadcrumbs, URLs that link to all the documentation, all the RFCs, all the Slack, this conversation that, have, that you had that um, generate the information on which uh, that informed your choices. In fact, after you've done it enough, the context breadcrumbs can generate a walkable, my pointer doesn't work, a knowledge network. And once you learn to crawl that network, you can discover insight and hopefully wisdom. One final tip to help people access the information in your work is to leave a summary at the end 
Now, I don't think we have time to go through all this, but um, here's the summary. Work, uh, to improve as a developer, try to remove your bottlenecks. There are many things that you can do. Try to think about how to improve at work, how to improve at not working, and how to improve at team working. Um, am I doing a time, actually? Yeah, I think, sure, okay. Um, I was Geo, I'm Geo. I work for Automatic. We are the maker of WordPress.com, Tumblr, WooCommerce, Jetpack, PocketCast, Day One, and a lot of other products. And um, Enview, there it is. <laughs> this page is not live right now, but if you scan that QR code, you will learn when it's live. And um, yeah, thank you for listening. Any questions? See, didn't I tell you he's good? Love it. Um, yeah, we've got time for questions. So uh, does anyone have any good questions? Or bad, bad questions? questions? Or indifferent questions? Any questions at all? Here's one. Hey, thanks. So, uh, the, the one thing that stuck with me was the context switching and how important it is, especially for engineers, not to yep. do a lot of context switching. But I noticed in your, in your diary you decoded once in the morning and then once in the evening. <laughs> Yeah. So like, how, do you, how do you communicate to people that aren't engineers in your team the value of um, like engineers staying on a task for a, a period of time? Because I think we all get it, but then yeah. not necessarily everyone else in the team does. Um, good question. How do you let people know the value, people that are not technical, understand the value of staying on task? Well, you send them the link to this talk as a, as a start. Uh, you might recommend them um, a few books like uh, Deep Work from Carl Newport and Attention Span from Gloria Mark that has been released recently. And um, I think um, part of it might also be a be the change that you want to see in the world. And um, without being um, standoffish or without trying to impose your schedule on other people, try to make it clear and say like, hey, I'm going to be offline for an hour because I really want to focus on this, on, on this thing. Or maybe make a good use of those occasions where like, um, there was a meeting and then the meeting is cancelled and now you're left with like, a, you know, one hour of empty space and you can say, oh, this is great because I'm really going to use this time to, to focus. Um, yeah, it, 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 it's tough. Something else could be to try to see if there's are other people that um, in, your, in your organization that seem to be delivering very well and ask them, hey, how do you approach focus and um, highlight their approach if it is in line with what you want to highlight. Because you say, oh, I'm just going to switching all the time, then I don't know, maybe we should have a chat and see if I have something to learn from them. Uh, just for our next question, um, Amy, our next speaker, are you here? She's over there. Oh, great. If you could just uh, hop over to the desk here to get mic'd up, that's oh, great. There was uh, any other questions? Great. It just occurred to me I should probably hold the microphone to avoid kind of passing it around, so I'll do that. Thank you. Um, just to add to the answer, I don't think the problems that face engineers are unique to engineers, although many others might not experience it to the degree. But for instance, you know, product folks, like everyone else in the squad, VAs, et cetera, they'll experience similar flavors of what engineers are going through from conversations I've had with them where you know, they don't have time to focus and they might not need the deep kind of focus time around like you know, developing features, but they still require it as well. And I think to sum up, like everyone's experiencing a degree of this in most of the kind of hyper-connected, remote first workplaces and just having conversations with them, I think you'll probably find some degree of agreement on this in ways that you, know, you should certainly be able to understand that develop ways as a squad to look through it yeah. and support it. Thank you very much for that. It's a great addition. Like, uh, um, we are software developer, we're engineers, but we are knowledge worker as well, if you go 30,000 feet view. And uh, our colleagues are knowledge workers as well. So um, yeah, there are common points that we can find with them. A uh, cheeky follow on to that answer is that uh, if you set up a, uh, uh, like a Teams call with just yourself, you show up as status in a call and then no one calls you. Uh, so that's a good way to block out some time. Pro tip, thank you.
Uh, one question occurred to me uh, when you were talking about um, time being like money. That's a really good analogy. But I was thinking the one way it's different to money is it feels like you can't save it. Like if you've got spare money, you, you, can, uh, yeah. you can save it up for a future purchase. If you've got spare time, you can't kind of bank it or save it. Yeah. But maybe there are, are there some ways you can use spare time when it comes your way in a yeah. way that is almost like saving it up for other purposes, for recharging yourself or something? Yeah. Well, the... I didn't do justice to the importance of rest in my imaginary schedule because there was only one lunch break and then work, 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 work. But like, um, yeah, if some spare time comes your way, um, taking a break is a, is, a, is a great thing to do. And um, that I, I would say I would see that saving, but like, yeah, saving it in a high interest rate uh, saving account because that, you know, when you have a break, you can Hopefully, if your break is in, in the four ingredients of a good break, you can recharge and, and, and get going. There's also ways of saving time that are, and I can, now I'm going to get a little nerdy, but like I recommend learning how to use your tools as best as you can. Uh, like uh, you work on a keyboard, learn to touch type, uh, you work with Xcode and learn all the keyboard shortcuts and find ways to get what you want to do faster. Um, that allows you to save some time. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, taking a step back and learning to use your tools better because yeah, that that is banking time. It'll save you later. That's brilliant. Um, everyone, if you could thank um, Geo for me, that was a great session. Thank you.